Hi, thank you for joining me on the Path for Health podcast. My name is Brandi Lloyd and I will be your host. I am a functional nutritional therapy practitioner and personal trainer. I've had a long career as a personal trainer, but about 10 years ago, my health status began to unravel. I eventually was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease called spondyloarthropathy. This is an inflammatory arthritis that affects nearly every joint in my body, including my spine. After a long road of discovering food allergies, incorporating stress management techniques, focusing on time on gut healing and hormone balance, I have finally found the restoration for my health. At this time, I am prescription free and hope to remain that way, but I'm open and grateful for whatever lies ahead. Most of my time is now spent helping people just like me, people who are trying to find answers to improve their health through diet and lifestyle changes. This podcast is for educational purposes. Please consult your doctor before making any changes based on what you learn here. My goal is to educate and inspire you. So please don't forget to leave a comment and share this podcast with your own circle of people. And I hope you reach out to me too. I have many different types of educational platforms and support. Now let's get on with the show. Hi there, welcome back. Let's just jump right into the material. Today we're gonna to talk about a rather complicated subject, but I'm gonna try and keep it between the lines. Hormones are just this massive conversation, but we're going to narrow it down to three hormones today, cortisol, estrogen, and thyroid hormones. Now, if you remember from previous podcasts, hormones are chemical messengers. They're actually created in your endocrine glands. You have 12 of those. And a few examples of endocrine glands would be adrenals, ovaries, thyroid, pituitary, pancreas, and your hypothalamus but there are more. Did you know that your fat cells are the largest endocrine gland in your body? I know, it's absolutely crazy. But endocrine glands actually secrete hormones, and your fat cells secrete a hormone called leptin, which you've heard of because it regulates your appetite by telling you that you're hungry. There's also another one, adeniponectin, and this adjusts how your body actually burns fat. Super cool. I love little tidbits of information like that. So since many of my listeners are between the ages of 35 and 55, we're going to talk a lot about the season. You know the season. I typically refer to it and the group of women that are going through it as sisters of the season. I'm in this season and I'm actually enjoying it. I think my mindset has a lot to do with it. There's just so many blessings around me in my life. My wonderful husband, this incredible business that I have, our children all live in the area. We're enjoying grandchildren. Got to pop in. Two of them popped in today with our daughter and one of our daughter in loves and got to see them. And I really enjoyed this season. This season also includes my husband and I crashing on the couch after dinner last night. We see an advertisement or something or a new documentary on babies and we look at each other and we're like, oh my goodness, we are too tired <laughs> to deal with babies on a 24-7 kind of uh, a schedule. You get me? I mean, it was different when I was in my 20s and my early 30s dealing with that, but no way. I'm absolutely enjoying this season of my life. But it is different. This is the time of life for us women when our hair and our skin start to turn dry. We start looking at those those ads on the face creams and crepey skin elixirs and everything a little bit differently, right? Um, our muscles start to lose a little bit of that tone look that we like. And suddenly we find ourselves um, either too cold or too hot all the time. And even hugging our youngest son is 15 and it, he never walks around this house with a shirt on. That's just how the Lloyd boys roll. And if I give him a hug and my hands are just ice cold, you know, <laughs> that's just part of the season. Uh, this is is also the time where we can tend to get um, over emotional and, and we have sleep disturbances yet some women feel exhausted all the time and don't get me even started about anxiety or all of a sudden how it seems like all of a sudden I'm just not a great passenger in the car anymore. And then there is the weight gain for a lot of women and the granny underpants and the saggy boobs and all the other things that we have in our minds when we think about the season. And most of you probably know that perimenopause, this season that I'm talking about, is about a two to 10 year 
a window uh, before you actually enter menopause. Menopause is that time where you haven't had your period or your menses for 12 months in a row. And really, things should stop. Your perimenopause symptoms at that time should come to a halt. But there's many, many women that I have worked with over the years that they're still dealing with basic hormonal imbalances even several years into menopause. So that's what I want you to that's what I want to talk about with you today. I want to talk to you about this perimenopause window and how to understand it and maybe some ways that you can make it um, a little less stressful and you can have a little bit better attitude about it. So I'm going to start this out by talking about the natural relationship between your estrogen hormones, thyroid, and your cortisol balance. Now cortisol come from your adrenals. Cortisol actually gives you focus and function when you are under like a right now kind of stress, right? It's a it's a fight or flight um, hormone. It's designed for short term bursts to get us out of a jam, like when your blood sugar gets too low, or we need to drive home to eat, you know eat and and you know we don't want to crash the car, so the cortisol level will rise. Or maybe your kid left their bag in the car and you need to sprint out to the field while your car's still double parked. That's cortisol that's going to help you get that done. And I know that there's a lot of talk about cortisol, cortisol belly, and and high levels of cortisol. And it really isn't a bad guy. It, It isn't a bad hormone. It's just that it needs to be used correctly. And we get into cortisol issues when it's every single day, all day long, our body thinks that we are in some sort of emergency or fight or flight situation. Now, all of our hormones are actually made from pre-hormones or precursors. This is going to get a little sciencey, but try and stick with me. Now, pregnenolone, often called the mother hormone, is a precursor hormone to progesterone. Did you know that progesterone actually calms you down? It counterbalances the effects of estrogen and it actually regulates the thickness of the uterine lining and it also helps us sleep. For most of the time that you are in perimenopause, your progesterone, which is higher when you enter it, starts to slowly go down, right? And that's that grab the the handle on the side of the car, the car door or whatever, when your husband is driving, that that, that feeling there is because our progesterone levels are taken a little slow over a two or 10 year period nosedive. The heavy bleeding and some of the more dramatic effects of perimenopause, we can usually point a finger to estrogen for that. And that typically happens towards the end of perimenopause. So when you are chronically stressed, and too much cortisol is in demand, the precursor, that mother hormone, pregnenolone, in order to make more cortisol, it's going to need to steal nutrients that it would have used to make progesterone, and it's going to take that, and it's going to make even more cortisol. That whole process is actually called the pregnenolone steal. It makes me think of that robbing Peter to pay Paul situation. That is exactly what's going on. Paul, uh, robbing Peter, well, poor Peter, he still actually needs whatever you took from him to give to Paul. So there is an imbalance in the story, and there's an imbalance in this pregnenolone, progesterone story as well. And all of this happens because we have become accustomed to living a very high stress life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So you see, our bodies have basically a right now kind of mindset. Your hypothalamus and your pituitary glands that regulate this process, this pregnenolone stealing, they don't really care too much about controlling your your emotions in the future and, and how it's going to feel to be that passenger in the car. They don't care about sleeping tonight or tomorrow. They are thinking, your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland, they are thinking, right now you are stressed, right now, how can we help you out? And that would be more production of the hormone cortisol. Now, hormones never work alone. In fact, um, when we require too much or we get too much of any one kind of hormone, it actually affects all the other hormones. And trust me, we have a lot of them. There are over 100 different hormones in our bodies. 
absolutely amazing. But let's go back to that pregnenolone steel that I was talking about. So the extra need for cortisol robbed our ability to make progesterone, right? Now we have high cortisol and low progesterone, but what else happens? Well, that pregnenolone, the mother hormone, was going to make some DHEA. It might still, but it won't be as much because of the steel that happened to create more cortisol. Now, there is another hormone, there's actually several more hormones that DHE make, and those hormones are androstenedione, I have a hard time saying that one, estrone and estriol. They're all made from DHA. So that one steel is actually taking away from those three other hormones that our body needs. Now the androenesdione, that ends up going on to make testosterone. And estrone is actually the precursor for estradiol. I know, I know, that's kind of a lot. But Hormone, all the hormones that we're talking about, they're actually called your sex steroid hormones, and that is because they're made from cholesterol. So eat those healthy fats because they're so um, important for your overall hormone production, especially these sex steroid hormones. So let's talk about estradiol, estriol, and estrone. They're all members of the estrogen family. So when we just kind of casually say that we're getting low on estrogen, we're actually talking about that whole family of estrogen. So here's a common question that I actually get asked frequent, frequently. You know, what is hormone imbalance? And if somebody is suffering, if a woman is suffering from the effects of perimenopause, can they just go down and get on some estrogen, whether it's a cream, a pill, or, you know, whatever, to make them feel better? Is that appropriate, um, especially when their estrogen should be technically lower at that age? Now, hormone imbalance can come in many different forms. So that's why this question is so confusing and so deep. There's a lot we still don't know about hormones, and one of the things that we don't know is exactly why we have hot flashes and night sweats. We know we have them. We know that they're associated with perimenopause and menopause. We even know some strategies as to how to reduce them, and I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about that, but actually science is still kind of scratching its head on that. I find this absolutely amazing. But back to hormone balance. When your hormones are balanced, you feel great, you look great. But when they aren't, it just takes a little digging to find out what's going on. But it really can be done. Sometimes that digging, all of, a lot of times, is going to require diet and lifestyle changes. And sometimes it is going to be um, re requiring you to slap on some um, uh, hormone replacement help, whether it's in the form of a cream or a patch or a pill or, or whatever. It, the most important part for you to walk away with is to realize that we are all individuals and what may work for somebody else might not be an answer for you, but to keep an open mind and to stay focused and really be persistent in trying to find out ways to improve your hormone situation and overall balance. So the most common imbalances for women, I'm going to go over a few of them, are high estrogen, or we call that estrogen dominance, high cortisol, low thyroid, low pregnenolone, low progesterone, and low estrogen. So let's talk about each one of these care, uh, categories. So high estrogen or estrogen dominance, this is super common, especially when you are in those reproductive years. When you have high estrogen, you usually feel like you have heavy or painful periods and you might get fibroids, ovarian cysts, swollen or tender breasts at times, and it really puts you at a high risk for breast cancer and it also encourages quite a bit of fat storage. Now, if you have high cortisol, that leaves you feeling wired, yet tired all the time. You can't fall asleep, and when you do, you really can't stay asleep. So you wake up groggy and not ready to start your day. You definitely store fat on your belly as well. That's that little cortisol belly feel. So what does low thyroid feel like? Pretty much draggy. 
Ask any of your friends that have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, just this really blah kind of feeling. You gain weight on your hips, butt, and thighs. Your hair may thin. The outer edges of your eyebrows kind of start to thin and disappear. Sometimes that even affects your eyelashes. Brain fog is a real problem, as is constipation. And just like I mentioned before, just an overall feeling of blah and fatigue. Being low in thyroid puts you at actually at a greater risk of uh, later on developing Alzheimer's. So low pregnenolone, that's that mother hormone that I was talking about earlier, actually causes something called, um, hmm, what's that word? Uh, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anomia. <laughs> you know that feeling when you just blank out on a word? Um, it also leaves you with some anxiety, some mild depression, and even some mild social phobias or fears that are associated with low pregnant alone. Like, you know, no, I don't really want to go to the barbecue. It's funny how when your pregnant alone can get low like that, it's because it's not make, making as much DHEA, which is going to make the progesterone that we're talking about that helps you sleep and gives you that uh, feeling um, of, of confidence because it also makes testosterone. And testosterone is the hormone that gives us that constitutive, uh, that confidence and that uh, virality kind of a feeling. You know, men have 50 times more testosterone than we are, that macho kind of feeling. Let's move on to low progesterone. Now remember, progesterone helps with emotions and sleep, but it also controls how thick your uterine lining is. So if you're pregnant, progesterone um, actually makes your... Uh, make sure that your body makes the uterus nice and thick to hold on to that baby. If you aren't preg pregnant, there's no need. And when your monthly period comes, um, it's going to be used to shed that lining. Let's talk a little bit about low estrogen, which typically happens at the at the end stages of perimenopause. Low estrogen, of course, is common, but it's it's not really a problem um, if you're between. <laughs> it's not a problem if you're between 38 and 51. It's a normal space, a natural space to be, but it might be happening too soon or too quickly and if you're in your reproductive years. So low estrogen makes you feel less interested in sex. Your vagina starts to get drier. Sex can even become painful because of that. And if you do happen to grab some slippery stuff and, and have some sex, typically women with low estrogen find it almost impossible to have an orgasm due to the lack of blood flow, um, especially around the clitoris. So that's not a fun place to be. A uh, low estrogen can also make your joints feel stiff and your your mental focus um, and your basic feeling about life uh, kind of blah. And then I did mention testosterone earlier. Um, high androgens or too much testosterone is actually a fairly common hormonal imbalance. Like rando hairs on your face, chin, or chest is very common. And it's really one of the main reasons for infertility. So we got a lot going on, but this is another tricky layer here because it's actually super common to have a mix and match of these imbalances. But the goal is how do we stay balanced? You know, what what can we do? Is this going to be the future forever? Well, no, you know, you don't it doesn't have to be the future forever, but you know me. I'm always going to point you back towards the basics. Now, we have lived for thousands of years on this planet, whether you um, agree with a young earth or old earth or whatever, but it's been the most dreadful situation in the hormone balancing kind of area, really just for the past 80 years. So what's different about... What's happened differently about in the last 80 years? I mean, we do live longer and we have eradicated certain diseases, you know, thankfully to things like antibiotics and clean water and sanitization efforts and better acute care in the event of um, injuries and accidents. But the factors that are often overlooked in these modern times that have a direct response to our hormone balance is really poor nutrition environmental exposures to tox toxins, excess emotional or mental stress, too much or too little exercise. These are basic lifestyle choices. So poor nutrition, right? This is actually appalling when you consider that most of the people that are listening to this podcast are not exactly living in third world countries. But we actually have poor nutrition, mostly because our foods are empty or devoid of nutrients and they're full of chemicals. 
We're not going to go do a whole talk about soil health and all of that stuff right now, but we all know that the food that we're growing, especially after we've been doing things like monocropping, has been a problem in the nutrition area, in the nutrient area of our lives, right? I mean, oh gosh, macaroni and cheese, right? This is a staple for most children. Processed foods are creating so many chronic illnesses, and that includes hormone imbalance as far as, I mean, if you don't feel good every single day for six weeks, I mean, you're technically, clinically chronic. That is, that is the definition of a chronic situation, is something that's lasting for more than six weeks. And I know that many of my listeners, many of my students that come and work with me and my clients, they suffer for years. So uh, what else is a factor here? Yes, aging does play a role. Genetics do play a role. But remember, we can't point everything towards our genetics. Basically, epigenetics tells us that our genes are only responsible for 2 to 10% of our health outcomes. And for somebody like me, what I hear is that means 90 to 98% is up to me in those lifestyle categories that we talk about all the time on the Path for Health podcast and in my Restore program. Restore is so easy to remember. Rest, eat, sleep, tribe, open up repair and exercise that's what it's all about that very first one is rest that's actually stress management in the three big areas i know i sound like a broken record but you know the more you hear it the more you're going to buy into it is reducing the amount of toxic load and stress coming from your physical environmental and emotional environment it makes massive improvements in your health So before I get too far off a field, we have talked a little bit about cortisol and how it's made and a little bit of what it, what it does for us, the fight or flight, and it also helps us, you know, balance our blood sugar. But a few important things to remember about cortisol is number, is this number one, the idea behind cortisol and how it should properly work in our body is just sparingly. It should be something that we fall back on, um, just in case and not that often and not for a long time, right? So we need to really employ our stress management techniques. Uh, Number two, cortisol is actually a big helper in blood sugar regulation. When your blood sugar starts to dip too low, it's cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine that will eventually get your blood sugar back in the healthy range between 80 milligrams per deciliter and 100 milligrams per deciliter throughout the day. Right? If it dips too low, then it's cortisol that's going to come to your rescue until you get that next meal. And hopefully it's a good meal with healthy fats and protein for a more sustained and even um, energy burn. And number three, probably the coolest little tidbit about cortisol is that orgasms lower elevated cortisol levels. So go get your, go get your orgasm on there. <laughs> okay. So have you ever had low blood sugar? It's actually called hypoglycemia. And I grew up, my, my sister and I both grew up with low blood sugar issues, meaning if we weren't eating every couple hours, then we were not feeling so great. We were, we would get lightheaded and kind of that spacey feel. We called it um, getting weird. We get sweaty and real lethargic. And my mom would have to give us some form of sugary something fairly quickly like orange juice to kind of get us going. It's a real pain in the butt way of feeling. And it just kind of keeps you tied to food. I'm not that way anymore. I figured it out. And I love that I can go for long periods of time without eating. And I feel great. I'm not thinking about food every second. My brain is working well. I've got wonderful energy. And it's just nice, especially when something comes up and we just don't have time. Maybe we're on the road and I'm not getting sick or feeling, like I said, feeling weird. So having balanced blood sugar is mandatory for hormone balance. No matter what kind of hormone replacement therapy you take, and that includes thyroid, you'll never feel great until you really get a hold of your blood sugar and get that under control. 
Now, eating whole foods is a great start in that department. Processed foods have a lot of hidden sugars in them. You look at things like ketchup and spaghetti sauces and whatever, jarred spaghetti sauces, and nine times out of ten, you're going to find sugar in there. It's crazy. In fact, it's getting really hard to even tell what sugar is anymore. There's so many different names, and some of the sugars are so synthetic that they aren't even having to be listed as a sugar. And the sad part is, is our body doesn't even know what to do with it. And then that creates a whole liver issue and a whole other podcast on liver and detox. So let's move on to perimenopause and menopause and estrogen. So it's a common misunderstanding that when you are in menopause, you don't make any more estrogen. But that just isn't the case. You just make less. Now, perimenopause is just an age, um, or it's not just an age. It is a change, and this change involves both your body and your mind. So did you know that perimenopause actually starts with progesterone lowering first and then estrogen before I said it earlier? I didn't. I literally wrapped most of my brain around the whole estrogen thing when I was growing up and considering what menopause even was. Now, the hardest part is that during this season that um, we are experiencing uh, um, during perimenopause, our hormones actually fluctuate month by month and not in the same calibration that it did in our reproductive years when we were probably on, it could be anywhere from a 21 to 35 day cycle. Most of my life was about a 28-day cycle, and nowadays I'm 20, 25-day cycles, and what's awesome is I have no idea when my period's coming. I don't experience any any changes, uh, PMS, bloating, fatigue. I used to have horrible cramps and everything, and really getting a hold of these symptoms and balancing my blood sugar was a big part of it. Any attempt to balance your hormones before you address blood sugar issues is just an absolute waste of time. You have heard me say it before. It's where I get to use one of my favorite words, futile. It is just absolutely futile, right? Okay, so let's talk about some of the changes that come when your hormones, which are fluctuating too much during that that perimenopause time. What does it what does it feel like? A lot of women, um, they get the expanding waistline. They do have more frequent periods. They have less of a desire of sex, but they have a lot of fatigue and a lot of moodiness. So, you ever wonder why sometimes your man looks good and smells so good? You know and that other times the fact that you can even hear him breathe or chew just drives you crazy, and you kind of want him out. That's hormones. That's some of that estrogen fluctuation that I'm talking about you know it's just it's just amazing to me like right before during that ovulation time it's estrogen that makes you look at him with those those eyes like that's the guy that's the man for the job I need to be fertilized even if you're not planning on having any more children the power of hormones is just incredible but that same hormone estrogen once it starts to wane along with it so does the desire to be in the bedroom and and with all the other effects of lo- that accompany lowering estrogen, like drier skin and more wrinkles, we don't really feel as sexy anyway. But the hardest part for us is that all the things that we used to do in our 30s to look good and feel good just aren't working anymore. And with the both progesterone and estrogen starting to lower, it's like, you know, what do we do? So exercise begins to be put on the back burner. We start picking up that glass of wine in the evening or the dark chocolate after lunch every day. And sadly, that really makes things a lot worse. Uh, We may be better at picking friends and saying no to setting boundaries because we're older and wiser. But oftentimes women aren't making those same wise choices with their food and with their wine, which exacerbates the problem because now we are adding to that belly fat. We are adding to the blood sugar issues. We are adding to being woken up two or three, four times during the middle of the night or maybe not being able to get back to sleep. I don't want to leave out thyroid in this just education and understanding about some of our hormones that really um, are the louder voices during the perimenopause years. 
So our metabolism is mostly controlled by our thyroid hormone. And it's not uncommon during the season for women to experience or discover that they're hypothyroid, which actually means low thyroid. So our metabolism slows. Now you can be low thyroid without being clinically low to the point where you need to have um, a thyroid medication or supplement. You could just have an underactive or a body, your cells not responding to the thyroid hormone receptors. Think of your cells of having like a lock and the hormones are having, they have like a key and it fits just like that in these receptors. So let's go back. I'm getting, I'm getting far off a of field here. Let's go back to the thyroid. The thyroid controls many important and fun, uh, functions for us. Um, our temperature is one like, um, you know, hello, I'm cold all the time. And another big one is our circadian rhythm or our sleep cycle. So this whole time frame that we're talking about perimenopause can be very stressful and um, it can actually wake up this ancient part of our brain called our amygdala. Some people even refer to it as our reptilian brain and this is what makes us tend to overreact or not be as rational at times as we normally are before this perimenopause season hit. Isn't this all crazy? I know, it's all crazy. So I hope what you're learning is that perimenopause is not a one or two hormone show, that there are many, many factors. And something we haven't discussed is what happens when your uterus and your ovaries are taken, taken out prematurely. What then? Right? We're going to talk about that in another episode. So um, in just a two to ten year process, we change so much. And for women that take that two to ten year process and cut it down to a surgery or two, oh man, it is a it is a massive change. It is a big swing. And no wonder they just run right out to get the hormone replacement therapy because I don't blame them. They didn't really have a tapering. They didn't really have a strategy. Okay, so now that you know who some of the big players are, I want to talk to you about some steps that you can take to make your journey, whether you are just entering perimenopause or you're in it completely or you're in menopause already, that your, your, your journey is done and maybe you're just still not feeling optimally. So I alluded to it a little bit earlier, and that would be the principles or the foundation of the Restore program. I would start number one with the letter R, and that's rest. Making sure that your body is actually rested. And by rested, I mean free from stress. I mean taking a look at the physical, emotional, and environmental stresses that are in your life. The physical stresses are, believe it or not, that's like food, right? Are you eating foods that have chemicals and toxins and, and pesticides and all kinds of stuff all over your food? That's a physical stress um, on your body. What's your environment like? How about the household cleaners? How about the lights that you have in your house and screen time and, and stuff like that, right? Some of the, some of the uh, chemicals that you use around your house and even your emotional stress. This is when I talk to my students about spending time with people that actually make you feel good. That's also part of tribe, I realize. But looking at it as a whole, just as an R, saying, am I spending time in the outdoors? Am I having time for gratitude, journaling, prayer? Do I do I have an intention for my life? Am I am I spending time to review what my day looked like? Did I spend time earlier in the day to plan what I wanted my day to look like? How did that go? It's really really looking at your life your life from like a bigger lens from a little bit further away when you're thinking about stress or resting your body and resting your mind so that's one thing that i encourage you to do is really evaluate those three areas the physical environmental and the emotional areas of stress that you could be overlooking let's move on to e let's clean up your eating whole foods Eat a nourishing diet. This is going to be instrumental on getting your hormones balanced. Hormones need the nutrients that are in our foods, like I mentioned, the healthy fats, and we need proteins, and there's plenty of uh, vitamins and minerals that we aren't digesting properly. So it's really taking a look at your health overall. Um, are you giving your body an opportunity to be nourished by healthy foods, number one? 
Are you taking care of your body by avoiding foods that harm you or cause inflammation or basically just yummy but empty calories? Take a good look at that and, and decide that you're going to be a nutrivore, somebody that seeks nutrients out more so than just following some type of diet, whether it's Whole30, Paleo, Keto, um, or Autoimmune Paleo, whatever it is. Finding foods that actually nourish you really, really matters here. Let's move on to sleep. If you are already having sleep issues, then I beg you, make sure that you take time every single day to prioritize sleep. That means setting a bedtime and not just a wake-up time. That means when it is getting dark outside, then lower the lights in your house. We're a big fan of lamps around our house, and I, and I turn the overhead lights off. I'm not a big fan of LED lights. I realize there's an energy reason behind it, but I like the old school lamps. If I could just have candles, that would be even better. So lamps with lamp shades. I even found some light bulbs on Amazon that the light bulb itself is totally filled up with Himalayan pink sea salt, which gives a nice warm kind of glow. Um, investing in blue light blocker glasses. Um, I wear prescription glasses and they are the, oh gosh, what are they called? The, the shoot, they're not bifocals, transition, not for the sunlight. Oh, progressive. That's what it is. The progressive lenses, which give me my far, uh, my mid range and my close vision all in one lineless situation. Um, my doctor went ahead and these lenses have a blue light blocking ability in them. The blue light rays are the ones that tell your brain that it is daytime and that you need to stay awake. Well, buying the blue light blocking glasses and using lamps helps to prepare you to go to sleep at night. Let's move into that next step, making sure that your room is ready. Decluttered, not a great place if you can help it for your treadmill and your computer and other things in there. It should be a place that is really for sleep and sex and that's about it. Make sure that it's nice and dark and, and cool. Your body can get underneath the covers and, and feel cozy. And watching TV in bed um, is a big no-no if you have sleep problems. So I and that includes screen time on your phone or any other device that you're using. I would recommend if you're somebody like myself, I lay in bed and I read like 10 or 15 minutes on a regular paper book. Regular paper book. And I usually try and find something um, that I want to go to sleep you know, learning something or feelings of gratitude or, or whatever. Nothing that's going to stress me out when I'm when I'm lying in there. So that we covered sleep a little bit. There's different supplements, and I'm going to go over some of those in a future podcast. But for now, let's just make sure that we prioritize sleep. So we're going to move on to the T for tribe. This is your community. I know a lot of us work, and we can't always pick the people that we work with. But outside of there, we can't. We can choose to be around people that make us feel good and we can choose to spend less time with people that don't make us feel good or that um, in, that maybe they tempt us into misbehavior even in the eating department or staying up too late or drinking too much or, or whatever it is. Choose your people wisely. That brings me to O for open up. Open up. We got a lot of stuff coming in. We have podcasts coming in, music coming in, television shows, the radio, the people around us, and all of this coming in. We need to make sure that we have quiet times for us to really process these things. Instead of just feeling our feels as we feel them, uh, actually sitting down and thinking about how we feel. Because just because we're feeling a certain way doesn't necessarily make it true. And another great thing about quiet time and especially journeying is it just allows us to finish our thoughts and get a thought all the way out instead of these fragmented kind of feels and um, impressions and then maybe possibly even rabbit trailing off or having in, you know invisible arguments in your head and if she said this then that's probably what I would say and whatever. So prioritizing your time to sit down and actually open up. This is all part of wellness. This is all part of balancing your hormones. This is part of balancing believe it or not your blood sugar. This is part of longevity. This is part of reducing inflammation. This is part 
part of even reducing pain, chronic pain like I have. This is why my day starts with getting my, my water with my little bit of squeeze a lemon in it. This is why my day goes immediately from that to putting on something positive or educational for me to listen to, which takes about 15, 20 minutes. And then I, because I'm getting ready, I'm getting dressed, I'm having my morning drink. And then I sit down and I read my Bible, read something um, that is inspirational for you. That's something about personal growth. And then I journal and then I move over to meditation. This is so important. I've just set intentions for my day. I just did some personal growth. I've made some decisions about what my attitude should be and what I should do as a person in my day to be the very best that I could. Now I'm going to go sit on that. I'm going to go think about it for a little bit and I'm just going to rest in that. And I do that with deep breathing and and I just let myself actually rest. And this is very good for repairing, which is our next step. I do that for about 15 minutes. So opening up is so important. Let's move on to repair. Repair means you can't work out or you shouldn't work out, especially if you're in the perimenopause years. You shouldn't be working out every day for six hours a day. You need to have some downtime. Sometimes that downtime is fasting. It's not just physical stuff for us to do. Sometimes, well, not sometime, all the time, I encourage people, if they can, to finish eating dinner around 5.30 or 6, 6.30 if they can at the latest, and see how long they can go the next day before they start eating again. We typically eat dinner around 6 o'clock, and I don't have my first meal until about 8.30, 8.30 or 9, I have my my first meal. It gives my body an opportunity while I'm sleeping to detox and to repair and I'm not digesting anything. And it's really, really good. And there's fancy words like intermittent fasting that you just did and you were sleeping for most of it. And as long as you feel good when you wake up and you're not um, starving to death and feeling sorry for yourself to the point where when you do eat, you overeat, which is what I would have a tendency to do when I space it out too long at the wrong time of the day or the wrong day. Um, intermittent fasting can be very, very helpful. There's actually a book out by Dr. Jason Fung, and it is called, I think it is just called Intermittent Fasting. I'll double check. I'll make sure that that's in my show notes, but it's a wonderful book. And he has another book out also on diabetes, and he talks about the use of intermittent fasting and reversing diabetes. So uh, the restoring can also include supplements that will help your digestive system, whether it's the hydrochloric acid uh, or digestive enzymes to help you break down the protein or whether you're um, supporting your liver and gallbladder for uh, increased uh, fat metabolism and, and absorption and, and, and use in the body, uh, whatever it is, a probiotics, a, or, you know, anything to heal the gut, like your L-glutamine, whatever it is, this is an important thing to know about your body, what needs to be supported, what needs to be repaired, and to put yourself in a position to actually um, take the time to do the strategies so that you can reap the benefits. Okay, so we're on repair. And the last one would be exercise. Typically women, I tell them, that are on the other side of 40, two times a week for strength training is all you really need. Two times a week of yoga is really all you need and walking every single day. So if you're doing the right kind of strength training and if you're doing good walking, um, that's the heart health that you're looking for. We're not in a position in these years to be bounding and breaking down our joints. Our body is already fighting against us a little bit with age there. So I do supplement with collagen. I do have an inflammatory arthritis, which affects my, my joints. And so I want to make sure that I have that extra added support, but that's all you need. You don't need to live in the gym five, six days a week and have these crazy workouts and try and compete with people that are in their twenties or thirties. So two days a week is great for resistance training. We need to build muscle mass. Frailty is an issue. Frailty will be your death. 
I can't remember what the statistic is now. I mentioned it the other day. I was going to look it up. But from the point you have a hip fracture, the average person only lives like a, like a year and a half or two years after that because of just the deterioration in their health. So lift the weight. Strong muscles um, will make strong bones. It's just how it works. Your, your bones, your muscles are going to pull on your bones. So your body will provide strong bones. Also the nutrient dense diet will help with your bones. Staying away from too much sugar, too much alcohol, especially the soda. Those are all bad for your bone, bone health. So eating the nutrient dense diet once again comes into play here. So remember restore. Remember, store. I hope this all helped you today. I hope it gave you a little bit clearer understanding of some of the hormones that you should focus on. In other episodes, I'm going to talk a little bit more about when to test and how to test. But for now, just having a little bit greater understanding of what your hormones are and how they work um, in your body is really helpful really helpful and if your doctor does do testing then it's going to give you an idea of what's going on it's very specific when to do what kinds of tests it's it's not just a blood draw there you go certain hormonal tests have to be done at a certain time in your month to get a good picture and different times throughout the day especially with cortisol testing which is typically blood saliva and urine so there is more to know on this subject i hope that this blessed you please let me know if this is kind of some of the stuff that you would like to hear. I do want to leave you with one tip. If you are somebody that is suffering from hot flashes uh, or night sweats on the regular, there was a paper that came out. Um, I believe it was in 2017. And they did this really neat study where they took women and divided them. They're all perimenopausal women and they divided them into three groups and two of the groups got different kinds of placebos. And the goal of the study was to reduce the amount of daily hot flashes that these women were suffering from. So the average amount of hot flashes that were happening per day for this large group of women, I think it was around 193. I can't remember off the top of my head how many women, um, had an average of 10 hot flashes every 24 hours. So two of the groups received two different types of placebos, and then one group didn't receive a placebo at all. They actually used a device, and the device helped them breathe in a paced fashion. So they couldn't take more than 10 breaths in one minute, and they would do this for 15 minutes a day. Just by doing paced breathing, which an example of paced breathing would be, I want you to inhale through your nose and for about four seconds, hold for seven seconds, and then exhale through your nose for eight seconds. And repeat that. Inhale for four seconds, hold for seven seconds, exhale for eight seconds. That is a paced breathing technique. They did something similar to that, but they use a device to make sure that they were doing it exactly the same every single time. So they did this for 15 minutes. They noticed an 18% overall reduction in the breathing group, just employing 18% reduction in hot flashes by just employing this paced breathing technique but it gets better. Then they took, for, I think they did that for about 12 weeks. Then they took this group of women and they added relaxing music to it, like classical piano or whatever is relaxing to you, probably without words, just instrumental music. I can find out for sure if you want to know. But they added music to it and they did the same 15 minutes and they found a 44% reduction in their hot flashes. Now it didn't help with insomnia and it didn't help with some other aspects of many of the other aspects, but it, do, it did help with the hot flashes. So we don't know what they were doing dietarily or anything else, whether they were journaling or if, what they were doing in their, in their life with their friends and their family and anything else that they were doing. This is just simply the mere act of employing a deep breathing, a measured or a paced breathing technique. 
pretty cool. So I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you so much for listening to The Path for Help. I am Brandy Lloyd, and I am so excited that you came and visited me today. If you would like a little bit of guidance with your hormone journey, I do have a free download on my website. It is my 30-day energy boosting program. Go and get it. It's got the list of foods on there. It has some helpful supplements. It's really great. Download it, give it a go, and let me know how you do with it. All right, I'll talk to you later. Hey, have a happy, healthy, and balanced hormone day. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I know I did. There's always so much to learn, digest, and apply. My passion is to share the wealth of information and experience that I have learned and am continuing to learn. If you find that you're struggling with your health and need some help, I'm totally here for you. I have many different programs and platforms to help you get to where you want to go. I am currently taking clients both online and in person, and I also offer self-paced courses as well as live and online small group classes. Make sure you're also signed up for my monthly newsletter, the blog, and the podcast. Staying plugged in is key to helping you stay on track with your goals. You can also find me personally on Facebook, Instagram, and most recently, TikTok. That's a blast. Thank you again for listening. I'm Brandi Lloyd on The Path for Health. I'll see you next time.